not the chat box. We'll be monitoring only the Q&A box for questions. And in the event that you need technical assistance, you'll see Jake Schmershansky's email there. Jake will assist you with any technical problems that you may be having. Now, speaking of today's session, social and environmental justice relevant to the bioeconomy or just noise. We've got a great and diverse panel. We have Mohammed Memphis from Will Williams College in Massachusetts, representing our youth component. We have Elin Bergman, Manager of Corporate Partnerships at World Wildlife Fund, WWF Sweden. She's known as Sweden's Circular Economy Queen. Stephanie Batchelor, Vice President of Industrial and Environmental Section from BIO, the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. And more detailed bios from all of our panelists can be found on the website. Our session chair is Chris Hessler, Managing Partner at AJW from Washington, DC. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce my longtime colleague, Chris Hessler. Chris, over to you and your panel. Chris, are you on mute? <laughs> yeah, I'm just sorry, struggling to get back onto the uh, on the program here. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Jeff, and uh, thanks for your kind words, as always. Um, uh, I, just a, a, a quick introduction on this conversation today. It's a little bit unique uh, in, the, in the context of this um, conference, uh, not, not just the 2020 version, which is unique in, in its own ways, but uh, uh, unique to the history of this conference. But Jeff and I talked a bit at the beginning of the planning stages about this and um, decided that it was a pretty important topic and the and the um, provocative title uh, sort of uh, indicates the the conversation Jeff and I were having because it's very easy for one to think about uh, progress toward a bioeconomy as being an unalloyed good just something that absolutely will deliver uh, uh, social benefits uh, across the board um, and and to take that point of view uh, is to be blind to a couple of pretty important risks. The question uh, facing the, this conference every year is scaling up. The question of how do we scale up, what are the most effective things we need to do, and anticipating and engaging risks before they stop scale, the, prevent the scaling up is really an important component of that. Um, and it's in, in that context that I, I, you know, I'm looking forward to today's conversation for anyone who thinks that these are not significant risks, that, that a failure to anticipate social justice or environmental justice questions um, is, is not a significant risk to the bioeconomy, uh, let me just present some counter evidence. Um, the, the question around the use of biofuels has come up repeatedly against the question of feedstocks and where those feedstocks come from. And so whether we're talking about the food versus fuel fight in, um, in the US after the renewable fuel standard passed in 2008, calling for a significant growth in the use of biofuels. Uh, that was in essence a, a social justice uh, question. The, the, the questions around feedstock production for biodiesel globally, as people think about what that means for palm oil and um, both the exploitation of labor and the exploitation of natural resources in, um, in countries where maybe the, the um, governance of, of resource management isn't as strong as it should be. Those are essentially things that can come forward and block the growth of the industry. Um, and it, it also comes up in, um, in more localized ways. In California, there's an enormous political fight that's broken out. Uh, California is the leading jurisdiction in the world in terms of promoting uh, the adoption of electric vehicles, but they're doing it by, um, by generally subsidizing the purchase of vehicles, or that's certainly one of the more prominent tools they're, doing, they're using. And that's come down as a, as a significant political question as to how, how does it make sense for California tax dollars to go to um, buy uh, fancy electric vehicles, uh, Teslas and whatnot, for rich people in Silicon Valley and, and not um, bring uh, folks in, in the less well-heeled parts of California along into the uh, energy transition. So uh, these issues aren't frivolous. They, they really can come up and stop progress if we're not thinking about it in terms of policy context, if we're not thinking about it in terms of long-term uh, business development. 
uh, context. So we have a fantastic panel here to talk about multiple dimensions of this. I'll ask the panelists to, to come on, uh, take off your, your, your mute and your, um, your video and join uh, the conversation. We're going to approach today's discussion largely as sort of an armchair uh, session. Um, and uh, Jeff's already introduced our panelists and pointed out their, their bios are available online, so we won't dally with that. Let's just start. Um, Mo, I've had the privilege of knowing you and working with you, and I think you're, you, know, you uh, carry the unfair burden of being a voice of a generation in this conversation today, but let's start with you, and let's start with the perspective um, from, from a younger generation looking at the need to change the world, but to do it in, in ways that make long-term sense. Absolutely. So hello everyone, my name is Mohammed, as was pointed out. I'm currently a senior at Williams College studying political science and environmental studies. Um, and I, I really hope, to, I hope that this will you know, provide a window into the ways in which environmental and social justice are, are poised to shape national policy making throughout the world and the implications that it has for the bioeconomy. So the, the first thing I'd like to start with is this idea of moral responsibility. Um, and I, I think that this is the entire premise of bioeconomy. This is what it's based on. Um, this moral responsibility um, and also sort of this need to address uh, uh, anthropogenic contributions to climate change. Um, in 2019, there was actually a Pew study where around 70% of adults in the US uh, stated that the federal government is not doing enough to protect climate and the environment. Um, and in the last five years, these polls have been conducted uh, in Canada, France, Mexico, Ghana, the United Kingdom, and they've all solicited similar results. And so many, um, or in fact, most actions demanded uh, from the federal government by the public and advocates on climate change have not been taken. And I think that this actually provides an opportunity for environmental and social justice to become more central to what that policy um, or group of policies are gonna look like moving forward. One thing that I can tell you is that at colleges and universities, you see uh, environmental justice and climate justice clubs and student organizations, um, not just a climate society or environmental club. Uh, the social and environmental justice piece has become central to uh, the perspectives that the younger generation has on this issue. And I think that especially over the last six months, we've seen the ways in which uh, race and class affects people's daily experiences and interactions when walking out into the world. And frankly, younger generations have realized that in prioritizing climate change, uh, there's also a more responsibility to dedicate time and effort to ensure that our climate and environmental actions are also more just. So there's a, a professor by the name of Dr. Robert Bullard, who's sort of, you know, labeled as being the, the godfather of environmental justice. And he describes this idea of environmental justice as embracing the principles that all communities and all people have the right to equal protection of environmental laws. Um, and that it's the equal access to the good things that make communities healthy, um, but that also makes sure that no community is, is overburdened. Um, and what was fascinating about this year particularly is that I, I sat and listened to multiple hearings in Congress uh, just, this, just this year where members from both sides of the aisle repeatedly brought up this phrase of environmental justice or climate justice. Um, and you heard it mentioned in presidential debates and forums and five years ago, that was not the case. Um, this intersection of racial and environmental justice and climate change uh, will be the issue of the, of the future. And I'm, I'm certain that uh, my generation will not let up on, on prioritizing its, its importance. Um, but that also means that a sector like the bioeconomy is, is gonna be under a microscope. Um, it will be under a microscope to see the implications that bioenergy, biomaterials, uh, biofuels have for social and environmental justice. Um, one very large global issue is the implication that these policies have for access to land and agriculture. Um, you know, if a policy, for instance, that promotes biofuel makes it more difficult for a community to access land that they deem necessary to farm and sustain themselves, um, then that's an action that would exacerbate inequalities and, and it would socially harm disadvantaged people. And I say to this that, you know, perhaps the most important realization um, to overcome in this type of scenario is to recognize that communities should not be pitied um, and, and that we, we shouldn't think of them as being sort of helpless and just vulnerable. 
um, but rather these groups could actually play a really important role in the decision-making processes uh, to make sure that, that such policies and, and outcomes don't happen to begin with um, and don't pose negative externalities. And this is, a, this is an issue that exists all across the world, as you know, Chris has sort of brought up an example of the United States um, and in other developed countries, but also in non-OECD um, countries. And I would encourage you all to think about the ways in which your perspective would be different of the bioeconomy if it was honestly framed in this idea of environmental justice, in this idea of human rights. Um, and luckily for you all, that, should, that, that could be a good thing for your bottom lines. Um, Chris brought up this idea of EVs in, in California um, and, and then, you know, almost just being credits for the rich. Uh, and there have actually been public officials in that state that have expressively, you know, brought up this idea and um, articulated why this is an issue. It's because people really just can't afford electric vehicles. Um, and so what ends up happening is that, well, you know, dollars are being transferred up the wealth ladder uh, and, the opportunity from this is that the obvious solution is to not pick EVs um, as, the, as the winner, which means that biofuels uh, going into conventional vehicles uh, that people have or can afford to buy um, for right now becomes the less expensive option. And so instead of the status quo, which is um, an EV or conventional petroleum fuel vehicle, uh, you have biofuels, which has the opportunity to expand you know, consumer choices and um, more than anything, it allows for low and middle income people to be able to decrease their carbon intensity without really having to do anything. Um, but it also doesn't stop there. A lot of my work has looked at how transportation has affected the health of low income communities and, and non white neighborhoods in the United States. Um, such neighborhoods are usually subject to have uh, more highways, more road infrastructure through them. Um, they're also more likely to use older, less efficient cars that contribute more to, to, to pollution and damage air quality. Um, and this is perhaps one of, if not the biggest environmental justice problem right now. Um, well, in California, the low carbon, carbon fuel standard uh, has been linked to helping avoid uh, more than a billion dollars in health related impacts from air pollution. Um, and additionally, that's estimated to grow up to 8 million by 2025. Uh, and, and its suite of clean transportation programs um, have avoided uh, over 100,000 cases of, of different health-related issues, um, and those numbers will continue to grow. So I think that being more thoughtful about the impacts of, of bioeconomy um, can really advance social and environmental justice, while also making these sectors more attractive to the public, especially as we go forward, um, and to policymakers. And overall, it has the opportunity to grow the bioeconomy market um, and to sort of get at those difficult questions uh, that can stall change uh, before we get to sort of the, the end point or the midpoint um, of, of policy making. And though, oh, thanks. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the last thing that I was going to say is that, you know, even though the example that I gave was for transportation, you know, this is, this is true for agriculture and food, electricity, chemicals, and so on. Um, it's an overlooked nexus where the social goals of the public and the economic goals from the private sector can really overlap. Um, and so I urge you all to, to take it seriously and thoughtfully and to take advantage of this opportunity while also respecting that, that moral responsibility to promote social and environmental justice. That was great. Thanks, Mo. And, and that intersections point, I think, is where we'll spend a lot of time in our conversation. Um, over to Elin. So we've got the, the um, sort of view that this is a gathering, uh, strengthening trends uh, from Mo. You sit right now in the intersection of the conversation between the environmental community and corporate actors who are trying to figure this stuff out. What's your perspective on the question? First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to this fantastic event. Uh, I think this is a very good conversation to have. So um, yeah, my name is Elin Bergman. I, I am the circular economy queen of Sweden, or I call that a lot. I'm also a circular economy expert at WWF, and I'm also running two different networks. One is the Swedish network CradleNet, which is one of the oldest circular economy networks in, in the world, I would say, it's 10 years old, and also Nordic circular hotspot. And uh, we would say that the, the bioeconomy is a big part of the circular economy. It's all about how can we make the resources that are finite that we're using right now, how can we shift from those into to ones, uh, resources that are actually 
sustainable and that we can uh, use over and over. And this is where the bioeconomy comes in. And uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, um, it's all about at WWF. I mean, we, our vision is that we need to have a future where people live in harmony with nature. And in the linear current economy, the fossil-based economy that we have, we're living in total disharmony. And, uh, and like Mohammed said in your fantastic speech before, uh, I mean, we have the greatest advocate for environmental justice in the world, Greta Thunberg, who's out speaking about this a lot. And she, the only thing she's saying over and over, it's like, don't listen to me, don't have me as a role model, listen to the science. And she's trying to really get the other people uh, that will be more affected than we will in Sweden. We are a rich country, so socialist and very equal in many ways, but we still have a lot of things to do uh, left. But, but she's advocating a lot that environmental justice is key and we have a linear, very broken system right now. Let's shift into a, a good, thriving bioeconomy where we have justice for all and, and you know, good prosperity, not just uh, growth. Uh, and that's just, it's bad for the planet. Thanks, Elin. So let's bring Stephanie in now. Uh, Stephanie, you're, you're part of the organization that represents the companies that are bringing uh, bio solutions to, to pharma, to industry, to agriculture. Um, and uh, there's an increasing focus in your organization on the issues related to justice. So um, can you talk a bit about that and, and, and uh, the perspective, both from the association and from the membership on these topics? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. So, you know, bio is the world's largest biotech trade association. So we represent innovative biotech companies who are, you know, improving lives, protecting the planet, and driving a strong economy through the use of biotechnology. Um, I think, you know, to some of Mohammed's points, our companies have been doing more with less, essentially. I mean, that's like the core of what we do, right, is, is to is to supply sustainable products and fuels um, to the world. So I see, to the point of our session, a really incredibly intricate tie-in with social and environmental justice and the bioeconomy. And I think, you know, look, this conversation is especially timely. The COVID crisis has continued to shine a light on the disparities that exist in healthcare, in the economy, food security, clean air, clean water. And these are challenges that are hitting hardest, you know, in the U.S. and our underserved communities. So in August, BIO announced our bioequality agenda, which is to challenge our industry to counteract this systemic inequality, the injustice that, that Mo referenced, the unfair treatment of underserved communities for now and in the future. And so as part of one of the initiative's core goals to promote health equity, Bio also wishes to foster enhanced nutritional, environmental, and mental wellness opportunities for our economically disadvantaged communities. And we think biotechnology just has incredible potential to unlock solutions for all of these communities. And that's, that's from the feedstock, that's from what we're putting into our soil to decrease land use, um, to mitigate that. That's the kinds of feedstocks we're using the kinds of fuels, the processes that are innately bio-based and innately cleaner that are helping these communities. So we're, we're really excited about having this conversation in a different way. I think being able to talk to communities, especially about things like biofuels, right? And be able to tie in the studies like the Harvard study uh, that came out of Cambridge a couple months back about cleaner air because of the use of biofuels, right? Less pollutants, less particulate matter. And so you can start to have those kinds of conversations. Then I think you're really speaking to consumer values. You're speaking to investor values. You're unlocking potential for the ESG community, for example. I think I think we're uh, increased ESG investments in the biotech space, something like 38% in just the last four years. So I think there's, there's a real nexus here to Moe's point and, and there's a real, um, there's real traction. And I don't think that that's going away anytime soon. So I'm just really excited about where we're headed. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, we've already got a question in about, um, 
about agriculture and uh, a discipline around agriculture and bioresource engineering, um, specifically about what's going on in Canada. I'm not sure any of us on the panel are experts about how to make things happen in Canada, but um, I, I, but the, the the question of of a bioeconomy and and how it plays out all comes down to how we're how we're handling uh, the grown resources, um, and, and so let's just let's just start there. The the if we're not thinking through the ways that uh, a bioresource interacts with its immediate local environment and then interacts with a, a, a global system, whether it's a global environmental system, a global commerce system, a global labor system, um, we're gonna run into to, to problems. And I know each of the three of you have done uh, some thinking about that and some work on that. And you know, my sense is there's an advantage to focusing on having the richest countries focus on bringing the bioeconomy forward because we have the resources to try and think through what the right standards of practice and standards of care are that then we can try and um, uh, implement as a, as a global responsibility system to make sure we're not racing to the bottom and, and going um, to resources that are um, more exploitive uh, and, and figuring out how to do that. But that's just my opinion. I'm wondering how each of the three of you are thinking about that and how you're seeing it work in, in the work that each of you are engaged in. Well, actually, I run a big agriculture um, project that we've just started in, in uh, the Baltic Sea region. So it's nine countries around the Baltic Sea is working on that. And especially now with COVID, the COVID situation, uh, situation, you can actually see that there is a big vulnerability in the system, because if we don't get supplies in, we are not self-sufficient in food in the whole region. Uh, we import around 50% of the food to Sweden. We can't grow food here every year. Uh, and the same thing with other uh, countries around the Baltic. And the problem for us uh, at working with this um, uh, initiative at WWF is we wanted to see like, okay, how, how is this, uh, the system working right now? And how it is, is that we are mining uh, mineral fossil um, uh, nutrients in mines from Morocco and other places that are politically unstable. And then we're taking the minerals into Sweden and the other eight countries. And um, we're, we're, uh, we have high productive agriculture, um, but then there's a lot of runoff into the Baltic Sea. So we're kind of poisoning, we're over fertilizing um, the Baltic Sea, so we have a really poisonous algae blooms every year. Instead of actually recycling and, and using the nutrients we have already in the region, uh, which we can, we can make the food system so much more self-sufficient. And also looking at the future, I mean, we're going to run out of those mineral, the fossil um, mineral fertilizer in, in the end. So why don't we work, uh, you know, try to fix this broken system, the linear system, and make it circular and bioeconomy, uh, like a bioeconomy system instead. Um, we have, you know, kind of a good economy now, even though there's a COVID and the pandemic going. So we should really try to change the system now. And especially now we have a European Green Deal going where they were pumping a lot of money into the circular and bioeconomy in, in the whole uh, European Union. So I think there's a, like, like a very big and good chance right now to, to really change the system and make it, you know, change it from linear to circular and, and uh, into a bioeconomy. And, and there is a lot of momentum right now and a lot of interest. It says in the EU that um, <clears throat> the bioeconomy is going to generate um, 1 million jobs uh, in a few years. So there's a lot of opportunity here. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'll hop on, on Elon's point, you know, there's there's a lot of potential for the bioeconomy and agriculture, especially when you're talking about nitrogen runoff, uh, algae blooms. You know, we're we're using algae to sequester carbon um, and and carbon systems, but we're also using gene edited microbes in the soil that can help route more nutrients to plants, and so that reduces the need for fertilizer. It min it minimizes nitrogen runoff. So I just I think we need to be you know, sort of lockstep with all of those kinds of developments. And I think focusing on agriculture is just so important. I mean, agriculture can contribute. It doesn't, it, 
doesn't not the problem. <laughs> it can actually help to become part of the solution for your food. You know, it's yes, it's great to reduce emissions in the atmosphere, and that's huge. And policies that I think we'll get into later, like the Growing Climate Solutions Act, can really be beneficial to help drive sequestration in soil. But you know, agriculture is is what's helping drive our food supply, which is so necessary. So. So being able to tie all those elements together through the bioeconomy, I think is critical. And no, like driving, yeah. No, I just was gonna say driving to climate smart practices is where we need to get to. Sustainable exactly. agricultural practices. So whether that's through, you know, certifications or continuous improvements, we have to we have to drive farmers to that end goal. I totally agree. And also in Sweden, uh, a lot of uh, the uh, the local buses and uh, a lot of other um, uh, public, trans public transportation, sorry, uh, is, is run by biogas in Sweden and it's generated locally. And so biogas uh, with biofertilizers, there's a lot of, you know, really good financial and, and um, business, you know, business opportunities in the bioeconomy from ag agriculture as well. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, you know, the, um, the first thing that came to mind when I when I heard sort of about the algae blooms is uh, really you know the fact that work is already being done to figure out you know more ways in which algae can be used um, as a, as a biofuel and I think um, it's really sort of pointing to examples of of you know that circular economy of all of all of these potential externalities of uh, new and exciting innovations in in ways to make use uh, um, of feedstocks to figure out. Uh, you know, if there's a problem that we face, um, how is a way that we can exploit that problem to promote something good from it? And I don't think enough thinking has gone into that uh, because the status quo in the past has very much been, um, you know, you can make an action uh, in one country and it could cause harm in, in, in some community in another country, uh, but there's a significant level of disconnect um, that really doesn't warrant for anyone to address that. Um, but progressively more and more, that's not the world that we live in. We're starting to live in a more connected world where those types of harms are becoming more obvious and becoming more prevalent. Um, and I think with that also comes, once again, that more responsibility to, to figure out ways to address them. So we have a question here that actually, I think, well frames the communication challenge uh, that, that all of us face. And again, I'll return to the point that uh, it's easy when someone's focused on making the chemistry of their system work or making the machine work, trying to figure out how to fundamentally create a new bio process that, that can be commercially viable. So it's easy for someone in that scenario to be thinking about their, their engineering and their, and their chemistry, um, but lose sight or not really even turn to these bigger questions that can impede scaling up. And the question we've got is, is the bioeconomy simply not replicating the old paradigm, another big industry linear system? And so there's a communication issue here, right? So many of us who think, well, uh, absolutely, this is going to, this presents so many potential scenarios for solving problems. It's fairly easy for someone to look at the narrative that we're discussing and be skeptical. So how do we address that? Yeah, well, actually, I mean, the bioeconomy, if you look back 200 years, I would say we lived in a bioeconomy. So this is just reinventing the, the old wheel, so to speak. So we kind of build a fossil based linear economy and we need to go back to, you know, a, a place where, where, like I said before, people live in harmony with nature instead of in disharmony. So um, I think there's I mean, there's a lot to do here, uh, but we still, even though if we're working with uh, bioeconomy, we can actually make products that are not good or we're not, we're not doing our homework enough. So we actually, like we, we can do a lot of things with coffee grains and make it into bioplastics or whatever, but maybe the, the, the material from the coffee grain is better to use as a biofuel or, or bio-nutrients um, like I talked about before. We need, really need to figure out where the materials are utilized the best way. Uh, so this is something, either we can do it good or we can do it bad. I think it's very good to do it, like Mohammed said, we, we need to figure out, uh, you know, read it our homework in a holistic way, where, how should we do this? 
the right way, where it doesn't do harm somewhere else, or, or we were destroying the materials instead of using them you know, the most optimized way. So it could be a good bioeconomy and it could be a bad bioeconomy, it depends on how we do it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true for all sectors, right? There's, you know, there could be bad actors and you want to avoid that. But I think, you know, Chris, to your point, uh, how do we communicate better? You have to speak to consumer values and you have to gain their trust because these are new technologies, right? These are, uh, you know, they're, they might be concerned about where feedstocks are coming from. So you have to allay those concerns, right? Good thing we have science <laughs> and, and facts, but you have to be able to communicate that science in a way that matters. So, you know, through the use of biotechnology, a company like Amaris, for example, they are a, a member of ours and they develop bio-based alternatives to key ingredients and in consumer products as well as medicine. So through the use of their bio-based um, squalene, which is made from plants, they save up to 500,000 sharks from being killed because that's typically where uh, squalene comes from in the use for vaccine adjuvants for something like COVID-19, right? So I think you have to be able to, to share those kinds of examples and allay consumers' fears when they have questions about feedstocks, you can talk to them about it. We have an abundance of feedstocks. Our, our farmers are, are doing incredible things, as I mentioned earlier, growing more on less land, helping to abate nitrogen runoff, helping to sequester carbon. We have to be able to, to talk about that in a way that matters to, to, to regular consumers, to investors. And, and I do think that we need to have additional friends at the table to help to tell those stories. Stephanie, let's, let's build on that and try and get a little more specific. And a, a question's come in about the, the global supply chain and, and you know, feedstocks that potentially come from um, uh, countries that aren't protecting indigenous rights um, or, uh, you know, again, you know, sort of the palm oil example, aren't protecting globally essential natural resources. Um, and, and the communities that, that wind up devastated because of the after effects of that kind of exploitation. Um, how do we, uh, how do we take steps that, that justify the kind of uh, communication and confidence um, in this type of a building system? There are obviously very real risks. And if we're cavalier, no one will believe us and we won't get it right. So how do we implement this? What do we need to do? Right, so studies, reports, data, smart policy, <laughs> the end. Um, <laughs> no, that's uh, being flippant. But I mean, a new study from ICF earlier this year showed that farmers have increasingly adopted sustainable farming practices and embraced new technologies that have allowed them to meet the demand for food and fuel while minimizing land use. But you know, it, it, this, this uh, sort of, I, I feel like very much debunked conversation ha comes up a lot. And I always, uh, my response to it, it again, yes, there can always be a bad actor, but when you're talking about scaling up and where your feedstocks are coming from, you know, we're talking to, to folks in Canada, we're in the U.S., to me, I'm thinking, okay, well, we have, we have smart policy that's going to uh, show us that, you know, I mean, a, a low carbon fuel standard, for example, is, is based on carbon intensity, and they're, they're going to know where that feedstock came from and whether or not it is sustainable and renewable, and you're going to be scored accordingly. Um, and, and I think that that'll be the case if we end up heading down the road with a new climate agenda into, a, you know, renewable chemical standard, for example. So I think that there's ways that countries can put smart policies in place to deter the use of protected resources that we, of course, do not agree should become your feedstock. So high levels of accountability backed by fundamental science that shows what, what and how we should be using, you know, what feedstocks and, and how we should be preparing them. That's what you're I saying. Think so. yeah. I think that's right, yeah. Elin? We actually did a yeah we did a, a, this big report for the Baltic Sea region, all the nine countries, uh, to just look at where are the sources coming from, both when it came to uh, you know to to where, where did the sources come from that run off into the Baltic Sea, and one of the things were just feed 
going to, to pigs, cows, and chickens, and so on. Where is it coming from? And we are also importing that. So that's also actually nutrient that's running up into the Baltic Sea. So we need to, if we can change and, and feed the, the cows uh, and, and, or maybe the pigs, at least, uh, the food waste instead, we don't have to import it from, you know, soy uh, grown in, in Brazil in the rainforest, for instance. So, so there is a lot of things to do there. And, and I think also it's the same in, in the Nordic countries or, or in Europe that we are really turning into more sustainable agriculture practices. And we're looking at the whole system, not just in, you know, small parts of the, of the food chain. We're now trying to connect all the, the actors in the agri-food system and, and even the sewage plants to make sure we, we actually do it right and go the whole way. And also when it comes to certifications like Stephanie talked about before, WWF is a science-based organization. We're trying to take really hard to understand science and make it easy for the public to understand. So I think that's just something that we've been kind of good at. And also we are the ones that are starting a lot of certifications like um, for sustainable soy, uh, palm oil, beef, sugar, cotton, you know, all of those, just to make it easier for the producers to know, okay, so this is a more sustainable, uh, you know, uh, material that I'm, that I'm sourcing now. And, and I can be, make sure, uh, I can be sure that um, I'm, I'm using a good material here in, in my, my value chain. So I think those certifications are also very, you know, good to have, and we, we need to start even more, I think, to, to make it easier to do right uh, in the whole in the whole system uh, going over to bioeconomy. economy. So there's a lot of things to do there. And I thought also a really interesting thing coming up is regenerative agriculture, where you actually do better than not not less bad. You just you do even better. You actually uh, making it the biodiversity better. You you know. You um, enrich the soil and so on, so you actually grow more and. Well, I can access the chat. Yeah, and I mean, look at you know, look at companies like Bayer and Cargill, right? They're helping farmers to be part of the climate solution by rewarding them for climate smart practices, so that they sequester more carbon in the soil, no-till farming, the use of cover crops. So that's you know, I think that's the kind of conversation you're having at the agricultural level. But then we can't ignore the incredible toolkit that biotechnology provides through the use of tools like synthetic biology and gene editing, which are completely changing the landscape for things like alternative proteins, like the Impossible Burger, you know, that, that everyone seems to know and love now, um, you know, and, and so many other opportunities in animal health and in human food that, you know, I think we should look at because it's completely displacing supply chain. Well, Mo, did you want to jump in on this? Oh dear, it looks like Mo may have locked up. Well, we'll, we'll wait for him to get uh, his, his connectivity issues sorted. Um, we'll come back to him when he's, he's uh, back with us. Um, Chris, I noticed that people are insisting on putting questions in the chat box as well. So if you want to look at that, go ahead. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I will. Um, uh, and and Mo has dropped off entirely. So hopefully he'll rejoin us here shortly. This is the, uh, you know, the, the modern challenge of, of conference speaking. But um, uh, be that as it may, a, a, a couple of interrelated questions here have come up around um, uh, rare earth metals, uh, you know, as part of the EV uh, uh, mix. And I think looking at that from a, a, an exploitation point of view is one of the ways it's easy to argue that a bioeconomy is a, is a net positive because it's a renewable resource. And if we get it right along the lines of what you guys are describing, then um, we've, we've addressed that. But I think it's easy for people to just try and create these competitions between um, different solutions. And um, as I said at the top, new solutions aren't going to be held to the old standard. It's not good enough just to be better than oil to, in order to be part of the future. Um, but, but definitions around what's good is, is going to continue to be a source of friction here. And that, that sort of question, I think, highlights it uh, in a pretty specific way. So let me, let me pose a very real scenario to the two of you and have you discuss, is this good or is this not good? 
So uh, in East, uh, in, a, in a neighborhood, a crowded neighborhood in East LA, not a high income neighborhood, uh, Los Angeles, um, there is an old uh, refinery that used to make asphalt, one of the dirtiest kinds of uh, refining uh, of, of products out there. Um, it was shuttered, acquired by a company that has converted it, and now it's going to be making 100% renewable feedstock-based uh, sustainable fuels, uh, primarily diesel and sustainable aviation fuel. So the, there's, it's bringing jobs back to the neighborhood, but it's still an industrial facility in that neighborhood. Uh, it is pr producing a, uh, a fuel that is a, a, a net benefit from a climate perspective, as long as its feedstocks are good. Um, but how do we know its feedstocks are good? And um, it's still a combustion fuel. So people can come at that very same scenario and say, this is our salvation and the road of the future. And other people can come at it with a healthy amount of skepticism. So as that is a very real scenario, I'd be interested in having you guys discuss it in, in the perspective of how, how should investors think about that? What should companies think who want to get into this space, knowing that those pragmatic questions are going to come up again and again? You want to answer, Stephanie, or should I? You can start. Well, we, um, we just had this really interesting uh, example in Sweden that was this big um, oil company, Prim. We're going to uh, make this enormous oil refin uh, refinery. And um, they were going to pump in billions, uh, both from the state, but also yeah, from uh, all investors. So it's going to generate a lot of jobs to this super small society in Lysekil in Sweden, West Coast. Um, and of course, Greenpeace came, all the other, you know, protesters came because it's going to not only uh, were Sweden going to miss the whole Paris Agreement target, we're going to uh, be one of the biggest uh, polluters uh, in, in Europe, uh, but they were saying, but if we do it here, uh, it's going to be so much more carbon em effective than if we do it somewhere else, so we're going to save a lot of carbon. So that was the, the thing that we're saying for a long while until last week when they were actually said, hey, there's, there's actually no long-term good um, investment in this. Uh, it's gonna be stranded assets, especially now when, it, when uh, the pandemic is going, there's no need for diesel, uh, even though it, it might be more carbon efficient. So we're gonna turn it into a hydrogen plant instead. And that was global news. And Greta Thunberg was out like, yay, and the whole, whole uh, environmental business. So, I mean, there are, sustainable jobs to create here and if we're going into even though it's better and less carbon uh, in in that production it's still less bad so we can't do less bad anymore uh, and it's also if, if you talk about fuel coming out from the, the bioeconomy I mean in Sweden right now uh, the forestry sector is saying hey we have more forests than we had the last 200 years because we're not a wood-based economy anymore uh, but they basically want to chop down every single tree to make biofuels and bioplastics and textiles and, and you know, the, the forest is the new goal, they say. But the, the reality of it is, if you're going to make biofuels out of it, it's still going to emit carbon. And, and then you have to wait maybe 80 years until the forest grows up again, so they, they can actually, you know, draw the carbon back. So then you, then you will have a, a, a net zero um, emission from, from that fuel. And right now we can't, we can't, you know, have any more, uh, we can't emit any more carbon into the atmosphere. Right now, we can probably in a hundred years, but right now we can't. So we may have to make sure that whatever we put out in carbon, even though it's bio-based, it's, it's going to be, you know, taking down, you know, very fast. It, we can't wait 80 years for it because it's going to be, it's still going to be bad. Welcome back, Mo. It looks like the Williams uh, University Library's got a Wi-Fi connection problem that's <laughs> challenging you, but uh, we're glad you've rejoined. Um, let, let me go. I, there's been so many uh, great questions and interactions on both the Q&A and the chat box, despite your admonitions, Jeff. Um, let me just kind of try and bundle a couple of these for, for discussion here as we're, we're closing in on the end. Um, uh, there's a number of issues related to self-sufficiency and, and the fact that self-sufficiency um, speaks to uh, sort of uh, 
production at a smaller, de at a sort of more decentralized scale um, versus the idea of scaling up being more of a, a central centralization uh, tendency. Um, so how do we think about that? And I think that also relates to um, where we want to pivot to the end, which is how does the government start taking productive, how do companies start taking production act, productive action? Um, the, the, you know, there's, there's some questions here about what's the best um, step forward for, uh, for uh, the, the bioeconomy for the government to take in, in Canada? What are the feedstocks for the products? How do we get the market barriers out of the way? Um, so there's a lot there to wrestle with, but let, uh, why don't I um, why don't I pivot because we are coming up to the end. It's going to come fast to to sort of using that as a preamble for this. Thinking about the, the path forward, the scaling up path forward from the perspective of companies, from the perspective of investors, from the perspective of governments, and from the perspective of individuals who are trying to make ethical decisions in these spaces. Um, how do we make sure at the individual level, this is not virtual uh, signaling, uh, like buying a Tesla, this is actually engaging in productive change uh, along the lines of what Mo was talking about at the very beginning of the, of the panel. Um, what are the things that companies should be doing to make sure that this, the scale up balances all of these complicated inputs in, in, when it comes to social and environmental justice. How can government facilitate that? So you don't have to address all of those things. That's, you know, thesis level material, we're, we'll, but, but pick some recommended actions for any of those uh, categories. Uh, Mo, since you've been uh, AWOL here for a little bit, why don't you, if you wanna jump in and, and start off, we'd love to hear you come at that first. Yeah, so, so I think it, it goes back to the, the questions that you're asking um, when you're, you know, sitting down and, and trying to figure out the next steps, you know, what you're going to do in terms of policy making for your country and um, for your company, excuse me, and really asking what are the implications from the suite of decision making that, that, that we have available to us? What are those implications going to be for um, different people, uh, depending on whatever your output and wherever your output is going to go? I think when you ask those questions, you're going to be surprised at what you may find, um, but you also are situating yourself in a position to address those harms before they can even occur. Um, I think on top of that, for, for the perspective of almost sort of selling this to the individual is really making it clear the distinctions um, between sort of bioenergy and, um, you know, just your fossil fuels. Think about the difference if you were to almost sort of map a web um, of of when using traditional fossil fuels, what happens from extracting that fossil fuel uh, to the end of it, right? It's, we think of it as just we consume and we waste um, and compare that to what's more so um, this regenerative web in, of ways in which uh, the bioeconomy works. And so you could really see, okay, it starts off as this piece of organic matter and, and look at the trickle of you know, the different places that this goes and, and it can be used for down the line. Um, I think making that clear and apparent just as a visual uh, is extremely on asking those questions to ensure that um, you're really centering your decision making uh, to, to, to expose all of the different externalities that can come from your actions. Thanks, Mo. Stephanie, you want to take a crack at some specific recommendations for any of those categories? Yeah, I mean, you know, thanks to biotechnology, we have the power to use a variety of feedstocks. We're creating biofuels with less greenhouse gases, renewable chemicals, making bio-based plastics that are renewable, biodegradable, recyclable. This is all reducing pollution, reducing waste, and helping to make our air cleaner. And you have companies like Ajivo or Alonza Tech that are demonstrating the ability to turn hydrocarbons and waste gases into clean burning fuels too. But if you want breakthroughs in feedstock development, then you need policies that are going to promote sustainable fuels that are technology and feedstock neutral to help bring them along so that you're not seeing a situation whereby there's a dictate, for example, for all electrification. There should be an, you know, 
all, uh, all of the above approach because we're going to need everything to get to the scale we need to. So, um, you know, we've been pushing at the state and regional level for a long time now at the, at the national level for a low carbon fuel standard. I do think uh, this conversation is a little fuel heavy, but I don't want to ignore the massive implications to the manufacturing sectors. Um, to decarbonizing manufacturing, we must modernize infrastructure so that biorefineries and foundries and mini mills, as, as some companies have, can indeed pop up all over the country in our underserved communities and in, di in disadvantaged areas in urban populations where where we can use synthetic biology to grow food in an old factory building um, or, or where we can change in Ohio or in Michigan uh, defunct uh, former pharmaceutical factories and, and facilities and we can turn them into biorefineries but there's a cost to that and there has to be supportive stable policy in order to help realize those goals. Happy to get into more specifics, Chris, if you need. Well, let's let's bring Elin in one more time, and um, and then let's see what how we're doing on time. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I mean, you said a lot already, Stephanie and, and Mohammed. Yeah. So I'm just gonna add to it. But I think if you take Sweden as an example, we already actually surpassed our goal for biogas. Uh, we had a 10% goal uh, for, for uh, biofuels, but we're actually doubled it. So we are at 20% right now. Uh, so that's that's. I mean, we we have we have a, nat a nation that actually has a, in like the toughest uh, climate targets on the planet. So we got to be climate neutral by 2045, and we have a carbon law, and we're doing everything we can. But still, there is a big. I mean, when it comes to bioeconomy, there is especially as companies, we have H and M and IKEA, for instance. They got to be 100% circular, both of them. They're super ambitious, but they're struggling right now because they they're really asking or there, there's like a bigger demand where it's actually there is a supply right now. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here, but the, the government and, and the policy side is actually um, hindering them to, to go as fast as they want to do uh, because there is no market for secondary uh, bio-based materials. We need, so we need to create a market. And also that's where the government comes in. They can actually subsidize um, the biomaterials or, or the uh, secondary materials much more because now it's 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 cheaper to buy virgin materials. So we need to create a market, and we I think we could do that together. And also we need to you know tell the politicians, hey, we want to you know quit the bad ways that we're doing business in. We want to really make sure we have a sustainable uh, business model. And you're you you have to get out of the way. You have to help us. Uh, so if there is a problem, you have to really. Uh, Talk to the politicians and say this is um, the problems we are having, the obstacles. Can you can you help us, you know, to remove them? And I think that that's uh, the similar. Uh, there's yeah, there's so many boundaries that need to be removed from the political side, both in in Europe and also I think over your, uh, where you are. So, uh, well, and we need to marry the policy efforts with again this continued conversation with consumers. They want what's in what's in your body, what's on your body, and what is around your body to be sustainable. There is a, a desire and a drive for that. What we need to do is to connect solutions made by biotechnology and, and help consumers to understand that those are the solutions that are gonna help them to have that more sustainable world. Yeah. You know, that, that takes us almost right back to where Mo started us, right? The, 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 this is, this is a demand that is coming from uh, a, a growing number of people and the, the trend certainly for, for young people is this is, they are prioritizing environmental protection and, and racial justice in their responses to surveys. They are clear trends of increasing uh, demonstration and participation in politics, government, social movements in that 18 to 29 segment. And it's not just in the last you know, uh, eight, 10 months, but that, that's a trend that's been gathering steam for some time and the, and the polling data shows that. That feeds into your point, Elin, that there are, there's more demand than there is supply right now. Um, are, the, are the universities doing enough to uh, create uh, a, 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 
a flow of, of attention on the, on the science disciplines and the business disciplines to make this work? Who are you asking? <laughs> you asking them? <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm lecturing a lot at, at uh, universities, and I would say, I mean, in Sweden at least, they're really waking up to the, both the circular and bioeconomy, and and that's, and especially the the finance um, institutions and economy were really lagging behind before the business schools were. So that's kind of interesting that they're waking up now, because uh, we have to talk about the economy and the bioeconomy, and we we haven't really got to that part yet. So now everybody's like looking at wh where should they start. So this is why I'm starting this uh, big uh, platform to together every all the project science everything is going into both the circular and bioeconomy. Uh, in the Nordic Circular Hotspot, because we need to scale up and we need to move faster than we are right now. So I'm, I'm trying to do my part here, uh, creating that platform. So, so for me, it seems apparent that from a science perspective, um, it is something that is, that is growing and receiving the, the recognition that it should. Um, and on the other hand, on the sort of economics and business perspective, I don't really feel the same way. Um, that could really just be the case of you know, economics can be a very slow moving discipline um, and bringing in certain ideas of, you know, for instance, we talked about like the regenerative economy and so on, um, really sort of push against a lot of the just, you know, schools of thoughts that are that are really used and taught in your economics classrooms and a lot of business classrooms. But um, it will be very easy to go look at really any university, especially a tier one research university. Um, and find that there are uh, groups of students and professors who are working and researching and learning about these issues. Um, and to them, it's, it's very clear that uh, there's gonna be an incredible amount of, of demand for this moving forward. So government uh, funding for research in the integrated disciplines we're talking about might really uh, generate a, a, a better base of support for all of this conversation. Um, last uh, lightning round question, 30 seconds each. Uh, we've talked a lot about the concerns and the challenges. Let's pivot and, and, and talk uh, about optimism. What makes you optimistic that we're going to get this right? Mo, let's start with you. Uh, you know, I, I think we're going to get it right um, because of if we, if we are including as many people as possible from as many different groups, policymakers, companies, right, the communities, the consumers, in our decision making, we will get it right. Um, because when you do that, you figure out what the good things are, what the bad things are, and you're able to put a, a filter on your actions um, to promote certain things. Uh, and so I think that we'll get it right. And I think that a lot of it because of the demand of our generation is going to ensure that we, we promote this in a way that gets it right. Stephanie, what makes you optimistic? I, I mean, the entire uh, bioeconomy universe makes me optimistic. Um, and I think that that's just because I see firsthand working with these companies, the incredible, amazing innovations that they are creating, the ability that synthetic biology has to just, and that's one, you know, platform technology to just disrupt so many pieces of our economy is, is just, monumental and we've seen it we've seen it through this you know horrible pandemic right we've seen how quickly science also i mean we haven't talked about you know regulatory issues for technologies but we've seen what can happen when technology that is ready is actually uh easily deployed and barriers are taken away so i'm hugely optimistic the technologies are there the feedstocks are there. This is the right time for the bioeconomy. And I just see some really good momentum moving forward. Elin, final, final uh, 30 seconds before Jeff cuts us off. Yeah, uh, well, I think everybody wants a future where people live in harmony with nature. And I think, I mean, social and environmental justice is just, it's, it's the hygiene factor. Uh, we can't have the economy, global economy like we have today. So. There's no alternative, so that kind of makes me happy. I mean, there's nowhere else to go. Let's go forward and let's do it, you know, in a bio-circular economy. Thanks to all three of you. Great conversation. I was privileged to be able to listen to it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. 
Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. I mean, uh, sadly, the hour went by too fast, and uh, what a great conversation. Uh, Chris, I wasn't on the panel, but if you had asked me what I thought government should do, uh, tax the stuff you don't want and provide tax incentives to the stuff you do want. Um, but uh, what a wonderful panel, and thank you, Chris, for leading uh, the discussion uh, and managing these great questions. If any of you want to connect with me, uh, I think you can see uh, my email address there and I can, uh, um, I'm talking now to the registered participants. If you want to connect with any of the panelists, then I can provide an introduction. Thanks to our platinum sponsor, EcoStrat, and a really big thank uh, you uh, to AJW for being today's session host. Thanks to our audience, thanks to our technical team of Jake and Eva, and please note that Next week's webinar is the Bioeconomy Development Zones, Driving Bio-Based Investments in Canada. And we're looking to have the first Bioeconomy Development Zone be in Saskatchewan. So that's next Tuesday, October 13th. And that is hosted by EcoStrat. So it's Jeff Passmore signing off. See you next week. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.